hello there so now let's move on to the next scenario here we have a 55 year old man who has had a new onset jaundice and epigastric pain which started a week ago he has started feeling nauseous with vomiting two days ago no history of weight loss drinks an average of 35 units of alcohol in a week and has been doing so for several years there is epigastric tenderness with no abnormal mass on palpation and bilirubin is 89 alt is 238 alp is 899 ast is 55 ggt 490 albumin 36 amylase 399 more than 50 percent of his bilirubin is conjugated and observations are within the normal limits aside from the temperature being 38.3 degrees celsius so the single most likely diagnosis is being asked here and this seems to be a case of colidocolithiasis however uh, another confusing option here can be alcoholic hepatitis or primary sclerosing cholangitis so we'll be going through colidocolithiasis and uh, alcoholic hepatitis and pancreatic cancer in more detail because these are frequently picked ones first remember that colidocolithiasis alcoholic hepatitis and pancreatic cancer they can present all of them can present with abdominal pain alcohol history and jaundice all three of them colidocolithiasis alcoholic hepatitis and pancreatic cancer abdominal pain will be there alcoholic history will be there and jaundice will be there now colidocolithiasis is the answer because this patient presents with an obstructive jaundice pattern and a fever the gallstones have likely resulted in ascending cholangitis as seen with features of tenderness in the right upper quadrant jaundice and a fever so we have charcot triad here that is a uh, fever jaundice and tenderness in the upper right quadrant now gallstones in the common bile duct may result in abnormal liver function tests the obstruction has led to acute pancreatitis which is apparent with raised amylase levels and uh, ggt is very sensitive but uh, it is not at all specific in this case raised ggt could be due to alcohol consumption or due to cholestasis so why in this question alcoholic hepatitis is wrong because ast tends to increase more than alt in case of alcoholic hepatitis In viral hepatitis, we studied ALT is more than AST, but here uh, it is different. Here, the increase in AST is more than increase in ALT. So AST tends to increase more than ALT in case of alcoholic hepatitis. AST tends to increase more than ALT. So AST here is 55 whereas ALT is 238 normal range for both is between 5 to 35 so clearly here ALT is raised more as compared to AST so it clearly tells it is not a case of alcoholic hepatitis because in that AST tends to increase more than ALT when alcoholic hepatitis is a diagnosis so this is not the case here furthermore a raised amylase would not be a typical finding in alcoholic hepatitis lastly fever cannot be explained if alcoholic hepatitis was the answer so another thing is uh, raised amylase levels are not a typical is not a typical finding in alcoholic hepatitis and fever also cannot be explained so now why 
pancreatic cancer is a wrong option because fever would not be a typical presentation with pancreatic cancer if you treated this patient as if he had pancreatic cancer he would be referred to gastroenterology to be seen within two weeks under the two week wait cancer pathway and he may become septic by then if cholecystitis is resulting in cholecystitis and pancreatitis was missed so if we misdiagnose this patient as a case of pancreatic cancer this patient may become aseptic they uh, sorry this patient may become septic uh if we are considering this patient to be a case of pancreatic cancer because we will then refer this patient to gastroenterology to be seen within two weeks period now this un this is a two week wait cancer pathway which uh, needs to be followed so in this period of two weeks this patient may become septic if uh, cholecystitis is resulting in cholecystitis and pancreatitis so if this cholecystitis is missed then it may result in cholecystitis and pancreatitis leading to sepsis leading to sepsis and uh, and that is the reason like because fever is not a typical presentation in pancreatic cancer so it's, it is a wrong option now why primary biliary cirrhosis is a wrong option around 50 percent of patients with primary biliary cirrhosis are asymptomatic if symptoms were present they usually start with fatigue and pruritus obstructive jaundice is a late sign fever is not typical so 50 percent half of the patients in primary biliary cirrhosis are asymptomatic and if symptoms are present these are usually pruritus or itching and fatigue obstructive jaundice is a late sign and fever is not typical now why primary sclerosing cholangitis is wrong in primary sclerosing cholangitis jaundice steatorrhea pruritus and weight loss are predominant features fever is not typical So here uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis is also wrong uh, in this jaundice weight loss pruritus statoria these are the predominant features fever is not typical so cholecystitis is the answer here because the patient presents with an obstructive jaundice pattern and a fever cholestones may have likely resulted in ascending cholangitis and uh, we have charcot striad that is fever with jaundice with tenderness in the right upper quadrant gallstones in the common bile duct may result in abnormal liver function tests this obstruction has led to acute pancreatitis which is apparent with the raised amylase levels if serum amylase levels are high because uh, obstruction has led to acute pancreatitis DGT is sensitive uh, now this raised DGT here because it is not specific here it could be due to alcohol consumption or cholestasis so in all three cholecystitis, alcoholic hepatitis and pancreatic cancer we have abdominal pain alcohol history and jaundice
So another thing here is ascending cholangitis has a classical triad of jaundice fever and right upper quadrant pain that is charcot's triad and uh, in case of alcoholic hepatitis ast tends to increase more than alt ast tends to increase more than alt it would mean alcoholic hepatitis and there will be no fever in that Albumin is a marker of liver functionality and low albumin would mean chronic liver disease. Now if raised ALP is more than ALT then it would mean cholestasis can be acute ascending cholangitis extrahepatic or intrahepatic obstruction now we will study a little about liver function tests let's also see if we have a chart on this Now here are some examples of abnormal liver function function tests which helps in pointing towards an underlying disease. Now this is very important. Uh, if there is isolated raised bilirubin in an otherwise well patient, it is likely a case of Gilbert syndrome. If only bilirubin is raised, otherwise the patient is well, then it is likely a case of Gilbert syndrome. Action if one finds isolated raised bilirubin. First, confirm that it is unconjugated bilirubin. Gilbert syndrome has unconjugated bilirubin. Then repeat LFT, uh, blood uh, picture, complete blood investigations, reticulocyte count to ensure that there is no evidence of anemia or hemolysis. So we have to repeat LFT complete blood count and reticulocyte count so as to ensure that there is no anemia there is no evidence of anemia and there is no hemolysis if there is evidence of hemolysis then refer, refer the patient to hematology if there is no evidence of hemolysis then we have to manage the patient in primary care as Gilbert syndrome reassurance is all that is required now Another case is if increase in ALP is much more than increase in ALT, then it is a cholestatic picture. Cholestasis is there. If increase in ALP is much more than increase in ALT, then it is a cholestatic picture. It can be due to acute ascending cholangitis, extrahepatic or intrahepatic obstruction. Now third case is predominant increase in ALT that is ALT is much more increased than AST or there is predominant increase in ALT then it is a hepatitic picture uh, that is acute viral hepatitis. Now if the cause is viral infection if here uh, the cause is viral infection then ALT increase more than AST. If the uh, hepatitis is caused by a viral infection, then ALT increases more than AST. But if hepatitis is alcoholic hepatitis, then AST increases more than ALT. 
one can remember as viral for all spirits or alt alcohol so if alt is increasing more than ast then it is viral hepatitis if ast is increasing more than alt it is alcoholic hepatitis so as as for spirits so it is more in case of alcoholic hepatitis but if alp is more increased than alt if increase in alp is much more than increase in alt then it is cholestatic picture that is acute ascending cholangitis extra hepatic or intrahepatic obstruction another case is low albumin low albumin indicates cld that is chronic liver disease then isolated rays of alp isolated rays of alp can be physiological uh, or it can represent a bony disease it can be physiological such as in pregnancy or growing adolescence or it can represent bony disease such as osteomalacia pigets disease bone malignancies so uh, we have to understand liver function test so as to uh, point out towards an underlying disease first if there is isolated raised bilirubin in an otherwise well patient it is likely a case of gilbert syndrome what we have to do if we find isolated raised bilirubin first we have to confirm that it is unconjugated bilirubin because in gilbert syndrome there is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia then we have to repeat LFT and complete blood count and reticulocyte count so as to see if there is any evidence of anemia and hemolysis. If there is evidence of hemolysis, we have to refer the patient to hematology. If there is no evidence of hemolysis, then we have to manage the patient in primary care as Gilbert syndrome and reassurance is required. If there is increase in ALP more than increase in ALT, then it is uh, pointing towards cholestatic picture, cholestasis, which can be due to acute ascending cholangitis or extrahepatic or intrahepatic obstruction now if alt is increasing more than ast alt is increasing more than ast then it refer it uh, it is indicating towards viral hepatitis if ast is increasing more than alt then it is indicating alcoholic hepatitis as for spirits so we, we can remember it like that now low albumin low albumin indicates cld lower because there is loss of albumin and uh, low albumin indicates chronic liver disease now another case is isolated raised alp that is alkaline phosphatase it can be physiological such as in case of pregnancies or growing adolescence or it can be uh, due to some bony disease such as osteomalacia, Paget's disease or bone malignancies. That is about it. So now let's move further. Now we have a 57 year old hospitalized cirrhotic man who has abdominal swelling which has slowly worsened over the past three weeks. He has generalized abdominal pain which has been worsening and developing a fever overnight. An abdominal examination demonstrates rebound tenderness, shifting dullness. His bowel sounds are absent. He has a temperature of 39.5 degrees Celsius and heart rate of 105. Most appropriate investigation is being asked here. So, we have to understand that ascites is a common complication of cirrhosis.
Ascites is a common complication of cirrhosis and one of the complications of ascites is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis which is seen here in this case. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis should be considered in any patient with ascites and cirrhosis who clinically deteriorates. Clinical features usually include abdominal pain, rebound tenderness, absent bowel sounds and fever. Again, clinical features in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis includes fever, abdominal pain, rebound, tenderness, and absent bowel sounds. The organism usually gains access to the peritoneum via hematogenous spread. So there is hematogenous spread in, in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis uh, by which the organism gains access to the peritoneum. Diagnostic aspiration of 10 to 20 ml of fluid is taken to perform a cell count, gram stain culture and obtain protein levels. Of these tests, the best initial test is a cell count as raised neutrophil count more than 250 is sufficient to start antibiotic treatment immediately. The most accurate test would be a culture of the acidic fluid aspirate but organisms take days to grow. So neutrophil, neutrophil count from acidic fluid aspirate is the appropriate investigation here. A diagnostic aspiration of 10 to 20 ml of fluid is taken to perform cell count, gram stain, culture and protein levels. The best initial test is a cell count as raised neutrophil count more than 250 is sufficient or is indicative to start antibiotic treatment immediately. So the most accurate test would be a culture of the acidic fluid aspirate but organism would take days to grow. So again we have to understand that uh, ascites is a common complication of cirrhosis and one of the complication of ascites is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis which is seen here. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis should be considered in any patient with ascites and cirrhosis who is clinically deteriorating. Clinical features include fever, abdominal pain, tenderness, rebound tenderness and absent bowel sounds. The organism gains access to the peritoneum via hematogenous spread, diagnostic aspiration of 10 to 20 ml of fluid is taken to perform cell count, blood culture, sorry, uh, diagnostic aspiration of 10 to 20 ml of fluid is taken to perform cell count, culture, gram stain and uh, protein levels. The best initial test is the cell count. Uh, so we have to carry out neutrophil count because uh, if neutrophil count is more than 250, it is uh, sufficient to start antibiotic treatment immediately. Most accurate test would be culture of the acidic fluid aspirate, but it takes time, it takes days uh, for the organism to grow. So spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is a form of peritonitis usually seen in patients with ascites secondary to liver cirrhosis. Now features, uh, would be like uh, abdominal pain, fever and for diagnosis paracentesis is carried out and neutrophil count is done. If neutrophil count is more than 250 then we can start antibiotics immediately. The most common organism found on acidic fluid culture is E. coli. Management can be intravenous cefotaxim usually given. Intravenous cefotaxim is given. Antibiotic prophylaxis should be given to patients with ascites if patients who have an episode of SBP with fluid protein less than 15 gram per liter or child pug score of at least 9 or hepatorenal syndrome. So NICE recommends prophylactic oral ciprofloxacin or norfloxacin for people with cirrhosis and ascites with an ascitic protein of 15 gram per liter or less until the ascites has resolved. Now alcoholic liver disease is a marker of poor prognosis in SPP.
alkaline phosphatase uh, here given in the options is tested as a part of liver function test used as a parameter when patients have the symptoms of liver or bone disorders serum concentrations of alp increase in bone disease hepatobiliary disease healing fractures vitamin d deficiency pregnancy and malignancy so the answer here is neutrophil count from the acidic fluid aspirate that should be done more than 250 sufficient to start antibiotics like cefotaxel let's move further now we have a 57 year old man who has had dyspepsia for the past six months has been prescribed s2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors which he takes regularly over the past few months but it provides minimal relief over the past two weeks he has started to have difficulty in swallowing what is the single most appropriate investigation it should be done here now we have to study here about dyspepsia and endoscopy now we have to understand any patient with dyspepsia should have an endoscope that is esophagogastroduodenoscopy OGD we can say so any patient with dyspepsia should have an endoscopy and this endoscopy is OGD that is esophagogastroduodenoscopy if they have refractory symptoms while an optimal treatment is being given like proton pump inhibitors or S2 blockers for at least a month. The request for an endoscopy should be marked urgent because he has started to experience dysphagia. Any patient with dysphagia should have an urgent endoscopy to investigate for upper GI cancers. So again, we have to understand any patient with dyspepsia should have an endoscopy if they have refractory symptoms while an optimal treatment is given like proton pump inhibitors or S2 blockers and S2 blockers for at least a month. This endoscopy is OGD that is es esophagogastroduodenoscopy. And uh, the request for an endoscopy should be marked urgent because the patient has started to feel dysphagia. Any patient with dysphagia should have an urgent endoscopy so as to investigate for upper GI cancers. Now coming to dyspepsia and endoscopy. NICE has given very clear guidelines on which patient should be offered a gastrointestinal endoscopy or OGD that is esophagogastroduodenoscopy. Early detection of esophageal cancer and stomach cancer is very important. So we have to offer urgent upper GI endoscopy in patients with dysphagia. Second, 55 years and over with weight loss and any of the following such as upper abdominal pain, reflux or dyspepsia. So two categories of patients, one patients with dysphagia and second patients who are 55 years of age and over with weight loss and having any of the following features like upper abdominal pain, reflux or dyspepsia having dyspepsia, reflux or upper abdominal pain, having 55 years of age or more with weight loss. 
Now below are other times to arrange a routine upper GI endoscopy. First, either there is refractory or recurrent symptoms of dyspepsia despite optimal management, usually a month or four weeks of proton pump inhibitors. Second, treatment with second line H. pylori eradication regimen has been unsuccessful. We have to ensure the person stops any acid suppression therapy for at least two weeks before the endoscopy date. Antacids and alginate therapy are all right to use during this period. So other cases where we have to arrange a routine upper GI endoscopy are if there are recurrent or refractory symptoms of dyspepsia despite giving optimal treatment like proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers for at least a month or four weeks. Second is treatment with a second line H. pylori eradication regimen has been unsuccessful. So these are the four categories of patients where we have to offer a gastrointestinal endoscopy. Early detection of esophageal cancer and stomach cancer is very important. Now, which are the cases where urgent upper GI endoscopy is given? First is the patient with dysphagia. Second, patients who are 55 years or more with weight loss and any of the symptoms like dyspepsia, reflux and upper abdominal pain. Now, other cases where routine upper GI endoscopy routine uh, per GI endoscopy is done. These cases are first, if there are recurrent or refractory symptoms uh, of dyspepsia despite giving optimal treatment like proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers for at least a month or four weeks. Second, treatment with a second line H. pylori eradication regimen has failed or it has been unsuccessful. But we have to make sure the patient stops any acid suppression therapy at least two weeks before the endoscopy is done. Antacids and alginate therapy can be used during that period. Okay, now let's... And yes, this endoscopy can be named as esophagogastrodeutinoscopy. So let's move further now. Now we have a 25 year old man who has been having persistent diarrhea for over the past eight weeks. He has cramping abdominal pain, especially after meals. He has started passing blood and mucus in his stools over the past few days. On examination, his abdomen is tender at the right lower quadrant. Now blood results are hemoglobin is 109, white cell count is 15 platelet count is 521 crp is 42 single most appropriate investigation which would lead to a diagnosis here now here the answer would be colonoscopy which is the most appropriate test to identify Crohn's disease as it allows direct visualization of the terminal ileum and for internal hemorrhoids it is proctoscopy. So your colonoscopy would be the answer. Now an increase in platelet count and CRP can be seen in active inflammation. A fecal calprotectin would also be beneficial here but it was not included in this question. Fecal calprotectin would be raised in active inflammation in Crohn's disease compared to a normal result in patients suffering with irritable bowel syndrome. His symptoms of abdominal tenderness at the right lower abdomen from ileal involvement are consistent with Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease usually begins around the late teens or 20s. Colonoscopy would be the most appropriate test to identify Crohn's disease as it allows direct visualization of the terminal ileum. 
Proctoscopy would not go far enough to look at lesions caused by Crohn's disease. A proctoscopy would be useful investigation if there was rectal bleeding from internal hemorrhoids. Most of the time described as painless pearl rectal bleeding, which may splash into the toilet bowl. A flexible sigmoidoscopy would not be able to visualize the ileum. Barium enemas are rarely used to identify Crohn's disease and are reserved for when strictures of the colon disallow colonoscopies to pass through. So, we have to remember that increase in platelet count and CRP is seen in active inflammation. Both C-reactive protein and platelet count both are raised in case of active inflammation. And a fecal calprotectin would also be raised in active inflammation in Crohn's disease compared to a normal result in patients suffering with irritable bowel syndrome. If there is no active inflammation, this fecal calprotectin would not be raised. Now here the patient is having symptom of abdominal tenderness at the right lower abdomen, which is consistent with Crohn's disease. This Crohn's disease usually begins around late teens or 20s. In Crohn's disease, colonoscopy would be the most appropriate test because it helps in direct visualization of terminal ileum. Proctoscopy would not be far enough, would not go far enough to look at lesions caused by Crohn's disease because uh, proctoscopy would actually be useful investigation in case of internal hemorrhoids if he had rectal bleeding from internal hemorrhoids and it would be described as a painless per rectal bleeding splashing into the toilet bowl. Flexible sigmoidoscopy would also not be able to visualize the ileum. Barium enemas are rarely used to identify Crohn's disease. They are reserved for when strictures of the colon doesn't allow colonoscopies to pass through. That's about it. And Let's move further now. Now here we have a 55 year old man presenting with long standing gastric reflux, dysphagia, chest pain. He says it came on gradually, initially only noticed it with solid food but more recently has also been having symptoms with soft foods, soft foods as well. Barium swallow shows Irregular narrowing of mid thoracic esophagus with proximal shoulder wing. What is the single most appropriate diagnosis here? Already barium swallow has been done. Patient is having long standing gastric reflux, dysphagia, chest pain. And also this is gradual. Initially was too solid but now to soft foods as well. There are irregular narrowing of mid thoracic esophagus with proximal shoulder. So now we will study about esophageal cancer and some things about dysphagia. The progressive nature of symptoms here first to solids then followed by liquids or followed by soft foods it suggests a growing obstruction and it points to a diagnosis of esophageal malignancy that is esophageal carcinoma. Echalasia would present with inability to swallow both liquids and solids from the start simultaneously. 
so this is a case of esophageal carcinoma now esophageal cancer esophageal carcinoma adenocarcinoma has now overtaken squamous cell carcinoma as the most common type of esophageal cancer so it is the adenocarcinoma which is the most common type of esophageal cancer not squamous cell carcinoma risk factors smoking which is a risk factor for both adenocarcinoma as well as squamous cell carcinoma but it is associated with much higher risk for squamous cell carcinoma than adenocarcinoma second is alcohol intake third gastroesophageal reflux disease fourth barrett's esophagus which is a precursor for adenocarcinoma barrett's esophagus is a precursor of adenocarcinoma then fifth achalasia chronic inflammation and stasis from any cause increases the risk of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma so in achalasia chronic inflammation and stasis can lead to increased risk of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma very often in the question there would be a patient with a history of gastroesophageal reflux disease or barrett's esophagus and sometimes they would give a history of increasing dysphagia and weight loss so there is change there is gradual increase in the obstruction that points towards esophageal carcinoma esophageal cancer adenocarcinoma the most common type symptoms would be dysphagia weight loss upper abdominal pain reflux or dyspepsia and diagnosis would be done by upper gi endoscopy with biopsy of any lesion seen as the first line test then ct scan or mri scan of chest and upper abdomen is performed for staging So esophageal cancer, adenocarcinoma is the most common type of esophageal cancer. More common than even squamous cell carcinoma. Risk factors are smoking, alcohol intake, gastroesophageal reflux disease, Barrett's esophagus, which is a precursor of adenocarcinoma, and achalasia. Achalasia, in this chronic inflammation and stasis. from any cause actually chronic inflammation and stasis from any cause increases the risk of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma very often we can have a patient with history of gastroesophageal reflux disease or barrett's esophagus and sometimes they would give a history of increasing dysphagia and weight loss symptoms in esophageal cancer would be dysphagia weight loss upper abdominal pain reflux or dyspepsia diagnosis would be done by upper gi endoscopy with biopsy upper gi endoscopy with biopsy of any lesion seen as the first line test and ct scan or mri of the chest or upper abdomen is performed for staging ct scan or mri for staging let's go through the chart so it is important to remember when to refer for an urgent esophageal gastroduodenoscopy urgent upper gi endoscopy if the patient is having dysphagia or the patient is 55 years and over of age with weight loss and any of the following 
such as dyspepsia, reflux, or upper abdominal pain. Patient is having dyspepsia, reflux, or upper abdominal pain. So now we will move further. The main thing here is the progressive nature of symptoms. First it was solids, then it was followed by liquids and soft foods, which is suggesting growing obstruction, pointing to the diagnosis of esophageal malignancy or esophageal cancer. If there was if it was a case of achalasia, the patient would present with inability to swallow both solids and liquids simultaneously. Echalasia is characterized by failed relaxation of the lower esophageal and sphincter upon swallowing and absent esophageal peristalsis, commonly present with dysphagia to solids and liquids, regurgitation and retrosternal pain. Investigation include endoscopy to exclude malignancy, followed by barium swallow studies and esophageal manometry. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is characterized by associated symptoms of complication which arise as a result of reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus or beyond. Barrett's esophagus describes the dysplasia of the normal squamous epithelium of esophagus into the columnar epithelium of gastric mucosa. It is associated with gastrointestinal reflux and is diagnosed using endoscopy and histology. Risk factors are use of tobacco, obesity being male. Barrett's esophagus is a city with increased risk of developing adenocarcinoma of the esophagus and it's managed using proton pump inhibitors. Esophageal carcinoma, we have to watch out for red flags like dysphagia, loss of weight, loss of appetite, anorexia, vomiting, melina, anemia. Dysphagia, anorexia, that is loss of appetite, weight loss, vomiting, melina and anemia. Dysphagia, about dysphagia we know uh, it can be due to motility problem or due to mechanical obstruction. If dysphagia is to both solids and liquids, then it is most likely a motility problem, which is of two types, intermittent and progressive. Intermittent is diffuse esophageal spasm and progressive is achalasia or scleroderma. Now, if the dysphagia is initially to solids but progresses to involve liquids or soft foods later, it is most likely a mechanical obstruction. It is also of two types, intermittent and progressive. Intermittent is esophageal ring and progressive is esophageal cancer or peptic stricture. So if dysphagia to both solids and liquids, it is motility problem. Intermittent and progressive. Intermittent is diffuse esophageal spasm. Progressive is achalasia, achalasia or scleroderma. Achalasia and scleroderma in progressive and in intermittent diffuse esophageal spasm. These are motility problems. If, iso if dysphagia initially to solids, later to soft foods and liquids, it is a mechanical obstruction, mechanical dysphagia. Intermittent and progressive again, intermittent mechanical dysphagia, the esophageal ring, progressive is esophageal cancer and peptic stricture. The only case where barium swallow is used as initial investigation is a case of pharyngeal pouch. Because endoscopy in that case as an initial investigation can have a risk of perforating the lesion. Most patients with symptoms of dysphagia are referred for an endoscopy to exclude out cancer. Even the patient with high suspicion of achalasia are first sent for an endoscopy to rule out cancer. 
let's move further now we have a 58 year old man attending a follow-up visit to discuss his liver function test he initially presented a week ago complaining of passing bulky foul smelling stool which was difficult to flush for the past four months he also reports having an intermittent dull epigastric pain which radiates to his back and has lost 3 kg of weight unintentionally on further discussion he mentioned that he was admitted to the hospital four times over the past five years for acute pancreatitis and consumes a bottle of vodka every other day with no intention of cutting down on examination he appeared to be mildly ecteric and did not have a palpable abdominal mass alp is 100 alt is 30 tgt is 80 and tissue transglutaminase iga is negative now which of the following is the most appropriate investigation which is to be performed here now here we have to study about chronic pancreatitis postprandial pain then pancreatic cancer versus chronic pancreatitis all of these things so we'll take break for a while and I'll be back.
So uh, now we have a case of a 58 year old man who attends a follow up visit, discuss his LFTs and uh, he initially presented one week ago complaining of passing bulky foul smelling stool which was difficult to flush for the past four months. He also reports having intermittent dull epigastric pain radiating to his back and he has lost around 3 kg of weight unintentionally. He also mentioned that he was admitted to the hospital four times over the past five years for acute pancreatitis and he consumes a bottle of vodka every other day with no intention of cutting down. On examination, he appears to be mildly ecteric and he is not having a palpable abdominal mass. ALP is 100, not raised within normal range. ALT is 30 within normal range. GTT is 80, mildly raised. And tissue transglutaminase IgA is negative. Now, the question is asking the most appropriate investigation to perform. The answer here is fecal elastase. The points in favor of chronic pancreatitis here are the epigastric pain is radiating to the back. First, second, excessive alcohol consumption. Third, history of recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis. Predisposes to chronic pancreatitis. Fourth, near normal liver function test except for an elevated GGT. Recurrent attacks of acute pancreatitis may have led to the formation of structures along the biliary pathway, which may explain the patient's jaundice. Now, malabsorption and steatorrhea are noted when more than 90% of the pancreas is damaged. Therefore, fecal elastrase or chymotrypsin may be useful in confirming the diagnosis as fecal elastase is produced by the pancreas and it is passed through the digestive system unaffected. Low fecal elastase is equal to pancreatic insufficiency. The other options here like amylase which can be more confusing and fecal calprotectin, chymotrypsin, they are wrong. Amylase uh, is useful in the case of acute pancreatitis, not in a case of chronic pancreatitis. Serum lipase and amylase are often within normal limits in chronic pancreatitis. A serum, a serum uh, amylase of more than three times the upper limit indicates acute pancreatitis. However, serum lipase is more sensitive and specific than amylase. Fecal calprotectin is useful in the investigation of inflammatory bowel disease. Serum chymotrypsin is clearly a distractor here. Uh, if chymotrypsin should be performed for chronic pancreatitis, it should be fecal chymotrypsin, not serum chymotrypsin. We have to see that difference here. So first we have to understand that this is a case of chronic pancreatitis and all the points which are favoring that diagnosis are the epigastric pain is radiating to the back. Second, there is excessive alcohol consumption. Third, there is history of recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis, which is predisposing factor of chronic pancreatitis. Fourth, there are near normal liver function tests. Except for DGT, everything is almost normal in LFTs. So only DGT is raised. Now the recurrent attacks of acute pancreatitis may have led to the formation of structures along the biliary pathway, which can explain the patient's jaundice. Malabsorption and steatorrhea are noted when more than 90% of the pancreas is damaged. Therefore, in this case, uh, fecal elastase and fecal chymotrypsin may be useful in confirming the diagnosis as fecal elastase or fecal chymotrypsin. They are produced by the pancreas 
fecal elastase is produced by the pancreas and it is and it passes through the digestive system unaffected low fecal elastase means pancreatic insufficiency low fecal elastase is equal to pancreatic insufficiency serum amylase is useful in the case of acute pancreatitis it is often normal in chronic pancreatitis serum amylase of more than three times the upper limit indicates uh, acute pancreatitis however serum lipase is more sensitive and specific than amylase fecal calprotectin is useful in investigation of inflammatory bowel disease serum chymotrypsin is a distractor if chymotrypsin should be performed for chronic pancreatitis it should be fecal chymotrypsin not serum chymotrypsin now let's study about chronic pancreatitis a little more chronic pancreatitis causes first alcohol which is seen in the majority of cases second smoking third autoimmune clinical features Classically, it presents with epigastric pain radiating into the back. The pain is relieved when sitting forward. The pain is the most common presentation of chronic pancreatitis. Pain is episodic with short periods of severe pain. Eating may further exacerbate the pain. Statoria. Statoria occurs due to malabsorption of fats from the lack of pancreatic lipase secretion which could subsequently cause weight loss. Occasionally, the question writers may use words like offensive stools which are difficult to flush, which in other words represent the term statoria. Then, diabetes, jaundice. So, these are the clinical features. Jaundice is a lateral presentation due to obstruction of the common bile duct when the head of pancreas becomes fibrous. Remember, patients with chronic pancreatitis seek medical attention mainly because of symptoms of abdominal pain or mild digestion and weight loss. So, symptoms are basically epigastric pain radiating into the back, statoria, diabetes and jaundice, which is a late presentation occurring due to obstruction of common bile duct when the head of pancreas becomes fibrous. Pain is relieved when the patient is sitting forward. Pain is the most common presentation, is episodic with severe pain at short periods. Eating may further exacerbate the pain. Statoria is due to malabsorption of fats from the lack of pancreatic lipase, which can subsequently lead to weight loss. So there may be terms like offensive stools, difficult to flush in the cushion. Then there is diabetes and jaundice, which is a late presentation. Now investigations. Investigations here are fecal elastase. Low levels are usually diagnostic for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Fecal elastase is the most commonly used test for exocrine function. Second, transabdominal ultrasound scan, often as a part of the initial assessment to look for biliary obstruction. Third, cost contrast enhanced spiral CT scan which remains the gold standard for imaging technique for pancreatic disease. So three investigations, fecal elastase, transabdominal ultrasound scan and contrast enhanced spiral CT scan. Contrast enhanced spiral CT scan is the gold standard for imaging technique for pancreatic disease. But fecal elastase is the most commonly used test for exocrine function. And transabdominal ultrasound is used as a part of the initial assessment to look for biliary obstruction. Now ultrasound scan of abdomen are useful in the detection of gallstones if gallstones are a suspected cause of pancreatitis. If exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is confirmed, then pancreatic imaging such as CT scan would be more appropriate than an ultrasound scan. A CT scan of the pancreas would show atrophy, calcification or duct dilatation. 
Now what about serum amylase and lipase? Serum amylase and lipase may be elevated, however, in contrast to acute pancreatitis, levels are not strikingly elevated and in many cases they may even be normal. Management. Think of the individual clinical features and how to manage them. If there is pain, we have to carry out analgesia. If there is statoria or malabsorption, then we have to give pancreatic enzyme supplements and fat soluble vitamins. If there is diabetes, we have to give oral hypoglycemics and insulin. So this is about chronic pancreatitis. Let's go through it quickly once again. Chronic pancreatitis uh, causes are alcohol, which is seen in majority of the cases, smoking and autoimmune can be caused by alcohol smoking or it can be autoimmune clinical features classically it presents with epigastric pain radiating into the back this pain is relieved when sitting forward pain is most common presentation is episodic with severe pain in short periods eating may further aggravate the pain second there is statoria statoria is caused due to malabsorption of fats uh, due to lack of pancreatic lipase secretion uh, leading to further weight loss. Occasionally, we may find terms like offensive stools with difficult to flush, which uh, directly indicates statoria. Then we'll see diabetes, another clinical feature, and fourth one is jaundice. So jaundice is a late presentation which occurs due to obstruction of the common bile duct. Uh, due to the fibrosis of pancreatic head. Jaundice is a late presentation which is occurring due to obstruction of the common bile duct due to fibrosis of the head of the pancreas. So patients with acute pancreatitis usually seek medical attention because of symptoms like abdominal pain or mild digestion and weight loss. Now investigations here are fecal elastase the low levels are usually diagnostic for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Fecal elastase is the most commonly used test for exocrine function. Second, transabdominal ultrasound scan, which is a part of the initial assessment for biliary obstruction, to look for biliary obstruction. Third, contrast enhanced spiral CT scan, which is a gold standard for imaging technique for pancreatic disease. Contrast enhanced spiral CT scan. Now, ultrasound scan of abdomen are useful in the detection of gallstones. These are useful ultrasound scan of abdomen in detection of gallstones if these gallstones are suspected cause of pancreatitis. However, if exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is confirmed, like we have performed fecal elastase, and uh, it is used to check for exocrine function of pancreas that time it is more wise to use ct scan as compared to ultrasound that time pac pancreatic imaging such as ct scan would be more appropriate than an ultrasound scan it would show atrophy calcification or duct dilatation serum amylase and lipase in chronic pancreatitis may even be normal or they these are slightly elevated not as elevated as in acute pancreatitis management is then symptomatically, think we have to think of the individual clinical features and how to manage them. If there is pain, we have to carry out analgesia. If there is statoria or malabsorption, we have to give pancreatic enzyme supplements and fat-soluble vitamins because uh, there is malabsorption of fat. So we have to give fat-soluble vitamins. And diabetes. For diabetes, we have to give oral hypoglycemic drugs or insulin. Now let's study about postprandial pain. Postprandial pain uh, can be due to different causes. First, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It usually causes a burning sensation and it radiates upwards towards the throat. Second, pancreatitis, acute and chronic. Food triggers the release of enzymes of the pancreas, which often worsens the pain. There is epigastric pain. 
In acute pancreatitis, there is nausea, vomiting and fever. In chronic pancreatitis, we will have weight loss, smelly and oily stools. Peptic ulcer. In peptic ulcer, pain occurs 2 to 5 hours after a meal or on an empty stomach. Gallstones. In gallstones, pain especially becomes worse after eating a meal high in fat. It is associated with nausea and vomiting. Irritable bowel syndrome. Pain may be worsened soon after eating. It is relieved or at times worsened after a bowel movement. Abdominal pain, bloating and change of bowel habits for a period of at least 6 months. There is abdominal pain, bloating, change of bowel habits for a period of at least 6 months. That is irritable bowel syndrome. And symptoms can be precipitated by stress. So postprandial pain, uh, first gastroesophageal reflux disease which causes a burning sensation and it radiates upwards towards the throat. Second pancreatitis, acute and chronic. Uh, here food triggers the release of enzymes of pancreas and which often worsens the pain. There is epigastric pain radiating to the back. Acute pancreatitis, there is nausea, vomiting and fever. In chronic pancreatitis, there is weight loss, oily and smelly stools. Peptic ulcer, pain occurs 2 to 5 hours after a meal or on an empty stomach. Gallstones, in gallstones, pain especially occurs, becomes worse after eating a meal which is high in fat and it is associated with nausea and vomiting. Then irritable bowel syndrome, pain is worsened soon after eating and it is relieved or at times worsened after a bowel movement. Abdominal pain, bloating and change in bowel habits for a period of at least 6 months and symptoms can be precipitated by stress. So postprandial pain is usually seen in gastroesophageal reflux disease. It is seen in peptic ulcers, it is seen in pancreatitis, both acute and chronic, it is seen in gallstones, it is seen in irritable bowel syndrome. Now pancreatic cancer versus chronic pancreatitis. So why it is so difficult to differentiate the two? Because they can share very similar symptoms like loss of appetite, weight loss, diabetes both can produce abdominal or back pain or both can be painless they have similar risk factors alcohol and smoking why both condition can occur concurrently recurrent acute pancreatitis may lead to chronic pancreatitis chronic pancreatitis may lead to pancreatic cancer pancreatic cancer may cause acute pancreatitis now what should we look out for? Chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer. In chronic pancreatitis, we should look out for alcohol, cystic fibrosis if a young patient, history of acute pancreatitis, recurrent attacks of pain, pain-free interval and calcifications. Whereas in pancreatic cancer, we have to look out for smoking, jaundice, hepatomegaly, pain which is insidious in onset, severe back pain, body or tail lesion, then CA-199.
Now what about pain? Pain is the most common symptom with chronic pancreatitis. It is not uncommon with pancreatic cancer. At diagnosis, epigastric pain is found in 71%, back pain is found in 50%. Both can present with epigastric pain radiating to the back, both can have intermittent or continuous pain and both can also be painless. So here we have to understand why first it is so difficult to differentiate pancreatic cancer from chronic pancreatitis because they both share very similar symptoms like weight loss, diabetes and anorexia. Both can produce abdominal pain or back pain or both can even be painless. Similar risk factors are also there. They can have similar risk factors like alcohol and smoking. Now why both these conditions can occur concurrently? Recurrent acute pancreatitis may lead to chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis may lead to pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer may cause acute pancreatitis. Now, what we should look out for? In chronic pancreatitis, we should see for alcohol, cystic fibrosis, if young patient is there, history of acute pancreatitis, recurrent attacks of pain, epigastric pain and pain-free intervals, and we should look out for calcifications. Pancreatic cancer, in pancreatic cancer, we should look out for smoking, we should look out for jaundice, smoking, jaundice, hepatomegaly, pain which is insidious in onset, then severe back pain and CA99 this is the factor. So in pancreatic cancer we should look out for smoking and uh, jaundice, hepatomegaly, pain which is insidious in onset, severe back pain and CA99. Now pain is the most common symptom with chronic pancreatitis, not uncommon with pancreatic cancer, diagnosis of epigastric pain and back pain both are commonly found in patients around 70% and 50% respectively both can be present with epigastric pain that is radiating to the back both can have intermittent continuous pain both can be painless. Now. We have to understand that malabsorption and statoria are noted when more than 90% of the pancreas is damaged. Therefore, fecal elastase or chymotrypsin. Fecal chymotrypsin are useful in confirming the diagnosis as it is produced by the pancreas, fecal elastase, and it passes through the digestive system unaffected. Look, fecal elastase is equal to pancreatic insufficiency. Now, let's move further. Now we have a 23 year old female presenting with an 8 week history of bloody diarrhea. She says her bowels have not been right for the past few months. She frequently has to run to the toilet. A diagnosis of ulcerative colitis is made. What is the single most likely sign to be seen on barium anemia? Now ulcerative colitis, loss of hostrations is pathognomonic of ulcerative colitis. Loss of hostrations, loss of hostral markings is pathognomonic for ulcerative colitis. Cobblestone appearance is pathognomonic or it is seen on endoscopy in Crohn's disease. Other things are canters, string sign, rose thorn ulcers and fistula. These are seen on small bowel enema in Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis is very important. Loss of hostrations is a sign for ulcerative colitis. Whereas cobblestone appearance is seen in Crohn's disease on endoscopy. Canters sign, rose thorn, canters, string sign rose thorn ulcers and fistula these are seen on 
small bowel enema in Crohn's disease. So let's quickly go through uh, Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis very quickly. Crohn's disease uh, can affect any part of the GI tract from mouth to anus. Usually non-bloody diarrhea, abdominal pass is abdominal mass is palpable in right iliac fossa. There is increased goblet cells and granulomas on histology. Weight loss is more prominent than in Crohn's disease. We have cobblestone appearance, transmural and skip lesions. It is transmural, skip lesions and cobblestone appearance on endoscopy. Ulcerative colitis affects the mucous membrane starting from rectum. Ulcerative colitis is affecting the mucous membrane starting from rectum. Bloody diarrhea is more common as compared to Crohn's disease. Abdominal pain is felt in left lower quadrant. Here, not right. It is felt in left lower quadrant. There is decreased goblet cells and granulomas on histology. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is more common. And in ulcerative colitis, we have loss of hostrations. Drain pipe colon is seen on barium enema. Cantor's string sign, rose thorn ulcers, and fistula are seen on small bowel enema in Crohn's disease. Now let's move further. Now we have a 45 year old man who had an endoscopy earlier in the day for investigations for chronic abdominal pain. The next evening he returns to the hospital with complaints of chest pain and shortness of breath. The pain is worse at the epigastric area and it radiates to the interscapular region of the back. His abdomen is soft and non-tender. His respiratory rate is 29, pulse rate is 110, temperature is 37.8. Blood pressure is 12070. A chest x-ray reveals mediastinal widening. What is the single most likely diagnosis? Now this is a case of mediastinitis. Mediastinitis may occur after esophageal perforation which can occur during an endoscopy. Esophageal perforation or rupture should not be taken lightly as it is a life-threatening condition. Often air along the subcutaneous planes or into the mediastinum would cause chest pain, dyspnea and fever. Air along the subcutaneous planes or air into the mediastinum would cause chest pain, dyspnea and fever. This patient should be considered critically ill and requires management in the intensive care unit. It may be difficult to catch the diagnosis early in the course of mediastinitis as the signs and symptoms may be subtle. However, as the condition progresses, the patient would experience increasing chest pain, respiratory distress and odynophagia. The most prominent symptom of mediastinitis is the chest pain. The location of chest pain depends on the portion of the mediastinum involved. Pain at the substernal region, we have to think of anterior mediastinitis. Now pain at the epigastric region with radiation to the interscapular region we have to think of posterior mediastinitis. Pain if the pain is at the substernal region then it is anterior mediastinitis. If pain is at the epigastric region with radiation to interscapular region, then it is posterior mediastinitis. A 
Chest X-ray may show a widened mediastinum or air in the mediastinum. Water soluble contrast can be added if needed. If there is a diagnostic uncertainty, direct visualization using endoscopy is used to confirm the diagnosis. The principles of managing mediastinitis due to esophageal perforation include repairing the defect and treatment with antibiotics. <clears throat> So this is a case of mediastinitis and uh, mediastinitis can occur after esophageal perforation which can occur during an endoscopy. It is a complication. Now esophageal perforation or rupture should not be taken lightly because it is a life threatening condition. The air along the subcutaneous planes or air into the mediastinum would cause chest pain, difficulty in breathing that is dyspnea and fever. This patient should be considered critically ill and requires management in ICU. It may be difficult to catch the diagnosis early in the course of mediastinitis because the signs and symptoms may be subtle. However, as the condition progresses, the patient would experience increasing chest pain respiratory distress and odinophagia. The most prominent symptom of mediastinitis is chest pain. The most prominent symptom of mediastinitis is chest pain. The location of the chest pain depends on the portion of the mediastinum involved. If the chest pain is substernal, then it involves anterior mediastinum. If the pain is at the epigastric region if the pain is at the epigastric region and it is uh, radiating to the back or to the interscapular region then it is involving the posterior mediastinum chest x-ray shows a widened mediastinum in mediastinitis chest x-ray shows a widened mediastinum chest x-ray reveals mediastinal widening in mediastinitis or air in the mediastinum. Water soluble contrast can be added if diagnostic uncertainty is there then for direct visualization we can also use endoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. Obviously due to esophageal perforation in the management of mediastinitis repairing the defect and treatment with antibiotics will be there. So, if we have chest pain radiating to back or interscapular region with me widened mediastinum but there is no history of endoscopy, vitals are unstable, then it is not a case of esophageal perforation or it is uh, not a case of uh, esophageal rupture. It is thoracic artery dissection in that case because there is no history of endoscopy then it can be thoracic artery dissection so esophageal rupture we have to study about Meckel's triad that is chest pain, vomiting and subcutaneous emphysema. Macler striad, sorry. In esophageal ruptures, we have to study about Macler striad. Macler striad include chest pain, vomiting and subcutaneous emphysema. 
subcutaneous subcutaneous emphysema is a late sign of esophageal rupture one of the complications of esophageal rupture is mediastinitis which is characterized by fever retrosternal pain and chills fever chills and retrosternal pain So again, esophageal rupture, we have to remember macular striate. Macular striate is chest pain, vomiting and subcutaneous emphysema. Subcutaneous emphysema is a late sign of esophageal rupture. And uh, another one of the complications of esophageal rupture is mediastinitis. This mediastinitis... Uh, it is characterized by fever, chills, and substernal pain or retrosternal pain. Now let's move further. Now we have a 49 year old female presenting with right hypochondriac pain. Right hypochondrial pain. An ultrasound shows a large gallstone. BP is 120 85, respiratory rate is 18, heart rate is 90, temperature is 37.6. WBC count is 15. What is the single most appropriate management? Now, here we have to study about acute cholecystitis. And uh, the single most appropriate management in this case would be laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Because the patient is symptomatic, reassurance is out of the question. We can't reassure a patient who is symptomatic. The two remaining options are laparoscopic cholecystectomy or emergency laparotomy. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a preferred option here as there are no signs of gallbladder perforation. Laparotomy has a higher risk as it is much more invasive. So because it in this case, as we can see, the patient is having right hypochondrial pain. So the patient is symptomatic. So reassurance, low fat diet, those options are out of question here. So we have two options left that is laparoscopic cholecystectomy and emergency laparotomy. Now because emergency laparotomy is a more invasive procedure has higher risks involved so laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a preferred option. Because there are no signs of gallbladder perforation. 